everybody welcome to the wake up show welcome to the wake up show not the the wake up show the wake up show is for me you to wake up so that's why i named it the wake up show uh trying to share my videos so please do the same thing uh share the videos i care less about the likes just share the video all right it's for uh, everybody to be enlightened. It's for the glory of the Father, who I must say, first off, before I keep going, all praises to the Most High, in the mighty name of Jesus. All glory to the Father again, in the mighty name of Jesus. So I thank everybody for tuning in. As you can see from the title of this lesson, it's called Peer Pressure. Might want to get your teenagers. Eh, some of your kids too. All right. Peer pressure happens to everybody. It doesn't just happen to teenagers. I think a lot of us deal with it. It was harder probably to deal with as a teenager. But as you become grown, you start to uh, deal with peer pressure even better. But it's not that grownups don't deal with with any type of peer pressure, all right? Because we do. We got peer pressure, all types of pressures of this world to deal with. And that's what we're gonna deal with today. We're gonna deal and see different types of peer pressure that happen in the Bible and how some people dealt with it. So, before I get started, let me do one more thing, and then we're going to get started. So everybody turn to Matthew, I mean, not Matthew, to Isaiah 28. I'm going to do some reading. I'm trying to adjust my cameras because some of them are looking a little different from other ones. So, so we're all going to go to, let me make sure this volume is down. This volume is down. Oh, yeah, I had it up. Okay, so now. 
Let's go to Isaiah 28. And this is how I usually start off all my videos. Again, happy Sabbath, Shabbat Shalom, Shalom. All right, grace and peace, grace and Shalom. Many blessings to everybody. All right, all in the name of Jesus. All right, so let's start this. Let's start this the way I normally start off most lessons with Isaiah 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Who is the he? This is the Lord. This is the Father. I mean, this is Christ. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's the Father, too, through Christ. So let's get that together, too. So who is he going to teach? Those that are drawn from the milk and weaned from, I mean, weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. That's the nation of Israel. Because in Exodus 19, it was said by God, you shall be a nation of of priests. My lights are awfully bright. <laughs> but anyway, you should be a nation, a kingdom of priests. I'm sorry. So he has to teach his priests to teach the rest of the world, correct? All right. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Again, precept must be upon precept. There's many, many stories there's many, many things that the Lord wants us to see through his scriptures and his testimony. And that's why he's telling us, you can read the Bible all the way through, but then sometimes there's things you can put on top of another as far as precepts to get another message that the Lord is trying to get through to you. All right. Verse 11, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak unto this people. Now. At this time, they spoke Hebrew. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with speaking Hebrew. There's nothing wrong with learning Hebrew. All right? As long as it's the right Hebrew. But the Lord made this because he knew that we were so much of a stiff-necked people that we were going to go into slavery. We were going to go into captivity. And so he told us right here, he going to speak to us in other languages. The Lord God that I serve, the God of Shem, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, God of Jacob is a fair God. He's not going to throw nobody in the fire because they didn't know how to speak Hebrew. So don't let anybody tell you, you must speak Hebrew. Again, there's nothing wrong with speaking Hebrew or learning Hebrew, but don't let anybody tell you, you're going in the fire because you speak in English. He taught me in this English, and I'm going to teach in the English. Praise the Lord. Let's go to 8, Isaiah 8. So now that he's teaching and has taught and still teaching, the nation of priests, which is Israel, they are supposed to go out and teach as well. That's why Christ also came. Christ said, follow me. Remember, he went among his own people and he had to reteach them in order to go out and do what? Teach the rest of the nations. So when he taught the rest, when he taught them, he told them to go out. All right. No other nation. That's what our job is. That's what chosen means. You were chosen to go out here and teach the rest of the world about the salvation of the Lord. How do you get eternal life? How are we supposed to teach these other nations? How are we supposed to um, uh, teach, let them know about what this book says from Genesis to Revelation? Isaiah 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. So if you get anybody, I don't care who they are, says we don't need the New Testament. All we need is the, the, the Old Testament or the Torah. There's no light in them according to the Old Testament. If anyone says we don't need the Old Testament, that we just need the New Testament because it's just about Christ. Those people don't understand that Christ 
is the Old Testament as well. But if they don't want to deal with the Old Testament, they just want to go to Psalms and maybe Proverbs just to feel good. What does it say? If they speak not according to the word is because there is no light in them. You must teach about the gospel of Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, the law and the testimony, let's go to Revelation 14, my favorite verse. I'm going to start reading this every Sabbath as well. I mean, every time I do a lesson, because this shows the end. All right. This shows the end. Revelation 14 and 12. Here are the patience of the saints. You want to be a saint. You got to follow Christ, right? What did Christ say in Matthew 19? Keep the commandments. Matthew 19 and 17. But what is this saying that you got to do in order to be a saint? Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Your faith in Jesus or faith in Christ, who, how, whom, however you want to call him. The Messiah said, keep the commandments. That's how you get salvation. That's all we got to do. Ecclesiastes 12 tells us the whole duty of man is to keep the commandments. And that's what Christ taught. And that's what Paul taught as well. But I'm if I keep talking about that, I'm going to go into some other lesson. So let's get into this lesson. All right. Let's go to Revelation 12 since we already here in Revelation. Let's just back it up some. Peer pressure. Peer pressure is probably the most difficult thing that man has to deal with because it wasn't supposed to be here. All right. And plus, it, it depends on what type of peer pressure. There's good peer pressure. There's bad peer pressure. But what? which one do we deal with all the time? We mainly deal with the bad peer pressure because of the ways of this world. All right. Let's see not only how peer pressure got here, but let's see how it's kind of really started. It didn't even start on the earth. It started in heaven. Revelation 12, verse 3. Revelation 12, verse 3. And there appeared a wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. We all know who this great red dragon is. This is Satan himself. Having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. What are the stars of heaven? Those are God's angels. So he drew one third of them away. How did he do that? Peer pressure. He got game. So for all those that think they can defeat Satan, hey, at the end of this lesson, I'm going to show you how you try to defeat Satan. Because it's a daily thing to deal with whatever Satan has planted out here as seeds. If this cat could talk one third of all of God's new, uh, I can never say the word right. Unnumerable bo -bo 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 angels, then who are you? If he could talk these guys into turning against God, you ain't nothing. We ain't nothing. Verse four. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman. Who is this woman? This is Israel. This is us. Which was ready to give to which was ready to be delivered for her to devour for for to devour her child. Who is Christ? Who is Jesus? As soon as it was born. So Satan started a war in heaven. He peer pressured his brothers to turn against their father, our father. In the book of Isaiah, it says that Satan had so much wisdom. He got beside himself and he figured he could be God. 
So he peer pressured angels to turn against God. This is where this peer pressure started with the father of lies. Let's skip down to verse seven. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought against his angels. See, here's now a war. The mouth speaking things that ought not to be spoken is what starts. That's the peer pressure that people deal with. But then how do you deal with it? You got to keep the word of God on your mind. Let's keep reading. Verse eight. And prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So they were cast out. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels was cast out with him. All over peer pressure. One person, one little leaven spoiled the whole lump, right? So one individual talked to one third of how many angels there are, and they fought against the other angels, and they were defeated, and they were cast out into the earth. Peer pressure, the wrong peer pressure, can lead to bad consequences. Because what we know is the lake of fire is reserved for them. It's reserved for Satan and those angels. It was originally for them. Let's skip down to verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Satan knows this. He got a short time. Let me show you how short his time is. The book says one day with the Lord to us is like a thousand years, right? So let's just imagine this time next week, you know, you going into the lake of fire. That's how short it is for Satan. It may seem forever for us, but to that dude, it's like, man, I shouldn't have never went to war with God. I should have never turned against him. But I did. And now I got a job to do, which he's making me tear this whole world up. Satan doesn't is not against God. He was at one point, but now he's working for God. There's no war between Satan and the father. Satan has a job, too, now. Because he had another job and he got rid of it. He, he didn't want to do that job. He was the bright morning star. He was the most beautiful angel ever created. And he got beside himself. So now he got to walk to and fro on the earth, seeking who he can devour. Verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. He persecuted the nation of Israel that brought forth Jesus, that brought forth Christ. He persecuted him because this dude knows these scriptures too. And he knew that the nation of Israel, they are the priests that's going to help Christ help the father save the world or whoever wanted to be a part of it. salvation. Let's go to Genesis 2. But it said that he was cast into the earth, right? And it said, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. Well, let's see what he did as soon as he, he got here. Soon as he got here. Genesis 2. Let's see the warning first. I'm sorry. Let's look at the warning. Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So this is saying that the Lord made us out of dust, made us out of dirt, right? And he breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. 
And then man became a living soul. So he, if he just formed man and never breathed his breath of life into our nostrils so we can breathe, we'd be a dead soul. So the body is your soul. Not a little character up inside you that's pulling strings like you a puppet. You are liable for your own actions. You can't blame it on Satan or some little thing up inside your soul. Everything is on you. When judgment comes, it's all going to be on you. You can't turn and blame nobody. Man became a living soul. Let's skip to, down to verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the tree of life we know is Satan. I'm sorry. The tree of life is Christ. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is Satan. And they were both good for food. One bad, one good. And the one that was bad knew Good and evil. That's why Satan was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's skip down to verse 16. Because here comes the warning now. All right. Here's the warning. And God and the Lord God commanded man, saying, out of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now this was commanded by Christ. Christ is the one in this garden telling them what the Father's saying. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help me for him. So we know this is Christ because in St. John 1, it says that the word that was with God and was God made everything. Not the father, the word, which is Christ. So Christ is here in this garden. He's looking at Adam. It's not good for him to be alone. I made all these animals, male, female. I already made the blueprint of male and female in chapter one of Genesis. Now it's time to make this woman. Let's skip down to 21. And the Lord God had caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. And the rib <clears throat> and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. That's why woman and man is considered man family. Just like the father and Christ, the son, are the family of God. And what do they want? More family members. Verse 23. And Adam said, this is my bones of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh and they were both naked the man and his wife and were not ashamed so they they you know how little babies i got four children and every single one of them when i got them out the tub or if they mama got them out the tub ran off we like come back here so I put so I could dry you off or put something on you, you know, and they running around because ah! I ain't got no clothes on. They were not ashamed of <coughs> being naked. That's how Adam and Eve was. Until the woe upon, upon the inhabitants of the earth came upon one of them. Now let's go into Genesis three, verse one. Now the serpent was more subtle, which means more crafty. That means he's smarter than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. So all beasts are the same. We are beasts as well. We may be more intelligent than the regular beast, but sometimes I question that. Beasts use the bathroom like we use the bathroom. Beasts eat the same way we eat. Beasts breathe their breath of not the, the breath of life through their nostrils the same way we do. 
But it said that he was more crafty, more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, have God said that ye should not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. And that's where she messed up. This is where Eve messed up. Because that same mentality of a baby, that's what she had. All she had to do was obey her father who made her and not speak to, to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is Satan. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So she knew what God said. But remember, when you look at Genesis 2, the Lord said this first, then he made woman. So then how did Eve know about this? Maybe because her husband told her and taught her what thus saith the Lord. Verse four, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. Uh-oh, first lie ever told among men. Who knows what lies Satan said up in heaven to make them fall? But this is the first lie. Here we go the first time of peer pressure on earth now. See, all these this bad peer pressure, that's all this started with one individual. Lucifer, now Satan or the devil or that old serpent. Let's see what he said. Verse five, for God knoweth that in that day ye eat thereof that your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil, which is the truth. These two had no idea what was good or what was evil. This is why God said not to talk to this dude because he's going to tell you this stuff. And I don't want you to know it yet. Right? Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree desired to make one wise. See, now the peer pressure got on her and now she wants something really bad. That's how Satan plays even unto this day. He's fishing to see what do you really desire? What can I put in front of you to make you do evil? While Christ is doing the, the same thing, but in the opposite direction. Let me put this book in front of you to see if you're going to actually do good. Verse six, and the woman saw food and it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to a husband with her and he did eat. So she took the fruit. She took the fruit. Keep your marker here. Let's go to Hosea 10 and 13. So people can understand what this fruit is. Because too many people have, again, watched the peer pressures of this world tell them that it's an apple. Hosea 10 <clears throat> and 13. Hosea 10 <clears throat> 13. We're going to start at 12 though. Sow yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Ye have plowed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity, ye have eaten the fruits of lies. Not the fruit of an apple, the fruits of lies, because thou didst, because thou didst trust in thy way, in the multitude of thy mighty men. Eve trusted in her own <laughs> intuition. Oh, I know some sisters ain't going to like I said that. I'm sorry. <clears throat> but I've always said, if women's intuition is always right, why didn't y'all mother use this? Why didn't our mother use that? She trusted in her own intuition. Sometimes, sisters, your intuition is wrong. All right? So don't let nobody 
peer pressure you on believing every time you think about something that you're right when it comes to the brothers. All right. Now let's go back to Genesis three. Genesis three, verse seven. And the, and the eyes of them were both open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and, and made themselves aprons. So now the truth was you're naked because they ate from the fruits of lies, right? Let's keep reading. And they heard a voice in the, they've heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. Wait a minute. If it's only four individuals in the garden, got Adam, Eve, Lord God, and Satan, right? Here's the thing. Who was Lord God talking to? They heard his voice. <clears throat> I don't know if he was singing, but they heard his voice. I personally believe because this is Christ in the garden, he's talking to his father. But they heard his voice in the cool of the walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife themselves from the presence of the Lord, they feared him. They were scared now. They weren't scared before. Now they got fear upon them. Why? Because they gave in to some peer pressure. Verse nine, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. They had no idea what being afraid was about. Now they do. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree which I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Oh, did you talk to Satan? And the man said, the woman who gave is thou me to be with me, she gave me the tree and I did, eat, I did eat. Adam told the truth. He told the exact truth. That's all I'm going to say about that. He told the truth. The woman you gave me told me this stuff because that's exactly what happened. Verse 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And Eve told the truth. Nobody lied. She told, the, and, and when you get in trouble, children, you should tell the truth. If you already know what the truth is and you lie and later on the truth come out, it's going to be worse for you than it was when you first got asked the question. Same thing with us as adults when it comes to the father. All what will be in the lake of fire? All lies. Food for thought. And the man said into uh, verse 13, nope, verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, Thou art cursed above all cattle, cursed about every above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. I have a lesson called Devil's Food. Go check that out so you can see what the dust of the earth is that he has to eat all his life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his head. Heal. So he then gave a pun more punishment to Satan for applying his peer pressure. Now he's going to give punishment to man and woman for giving into this peer pressure. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. I used to breed dogs. I never heard any dogs yelling and screaming in pain when they were giving birth. My biological mother, she loved cats. Same thing. The only reason we knew that she was giving birth is because we heard the first or maybe the second puppy 
or kittens yelling. But if you kick a dog or accidentally hit a dog, they will scream. Arr! They will scream out loud. But why is it most? Why doesn't most animals scream while they're giving birth? Just us, just our women. Verse 17, and under Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Remember how this went. It went from Satan to Eve to Adam. And has eaten of the tree of which I command thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Remember, he told Adam this. Remember, he didn't say, as I command thee, saying, he didn't say that to the woman. He's saying it to the man. He's saying it to Adam. Adam, I told you personally. Thou shalt not eat of it. Curses the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, and for dust thou art, and to dust shalt thou return. So now, all this garden that I gave you, I said you can freely eat of all the trees that just grow and you could just eat. Now you got to work to eat. And you got to eat to survive. Because before then, you probably could just eat. None. Hey, I don't have to eat for a couple of weeks. I don't have to eat at all. I'm going to live forever. But you're going to have to eat to live now. You're going to have to eat to live because you listen to your wife tell you the fruit of lies. Your wife listened to Satan getting the fruit of lies. But Adam, I told you personally not to eat from that tree. So there's peer pressure. And then there's consequences. No one ever thinks about consequences. All right. The peer pressure that everybody gives into is because they're trying to be they're trying to do what? Be cool with the world. Let's go to Genesis. Let me see. Yeah, let's go to Genesis six. I'm going to skip that one. Let's go to Genesis six. We're going to mosey on down the book. Genesis six. Verse one, and it came to pass when the men began to multiply on the face of the earth that the daughters were born unto them and the sons of God saw the daughters of men that were and they were fair. Let's get something correct. This is not angels, sons of God. These are the sons of God from the line of Seth. If you go back in Genesis four, which I was going to read and read, what is it? Verse twenty five and twenty six. You will see that the sons of God, they kept the name of the Lord. Side note, what was the name of the Lord back then? Was it in Hebrew? Nobody knows what that, that is. So everybody, we need to quit tripping on the names, all right? Because they called upon the name of the Lord back then, and nobody knows what that language was. People trying to say, oh, it was Hebrew. There was no such thing as Hebrew back then. But I'm sidetracking. Let's get back to this lesson, all right? But the sons of God saw the daughters of men. So these were the, 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 the line of Seth because they were considered sons of God because they kept the ways of God. Everybody else was the daughters of men. And they took them as wives of which they choose. And, they, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Why did God cut the cut everybody's uh, ages down? Remember, they live eight, nine hundred years. But now the daughters of men were going to do what? Influence, peer pressure, the sons of God. So he cut and so he cut their ages down from Six, seven, eight, nine hundred years to 120 years. Why did he do this? 
Skip down to verse five. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So wait a minute. Hold on. God is like, I ain't going to let y'all live this long. I did say the day that you eat, that's the day you will die. One day to the Lord is of a thousand years and then nobody lived over a thousand years. But he cut it down. Huh? Like, I'm not going to let you live this long. Look how, look how, look, let's read verse six. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth. Now he's like, man, I wish I never done this. And it grieved him at his heart. Christ saw all this wickedness going on now because of peer pressure. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man who I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. And it repented me that I have made man. I have made them. Everything that the Lord made, he said it was good. Even when he made man, it was good. Everything he made was good. But one individual that messed up his angels in heaven, messed up his creation on earth through peer pressure. Skip down to verse. Okay, now we did that already. Verse eight. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. For all everyone that likes to say, oh, grace started in Matthew with Christ. Christ is back here in Genesis. Let's understand that. Christ is the one who gives grace and mercy. The father will kill you on the spot. Grace started in the garden. Something had to die when Adam and Eve sinned. And what does the book continue to tell you? He made coats of skin. So this is where animal sacrifice started as well. But we're going to keep on going and reading before I get into another lesson. Verse 9, and these are the generations of Noah. He was a just and perfect in, in his ways. I mean, in his generations. And Noah walked with God. That's because Noah was a son of God. That whole lineage from Seth coming up to Noah, those were the sons of God, not angels having sex with women. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and, Ye and, and Japheth. And the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence because of peer pressure. All this stuff was cool to do. And God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupt his way upon the earth. All flesh did. Everybody corrupted their own way. And this wasn't a good thing to do. Because everyone's thinking their own way is right. And the Lord said what? He said, your ways are not my ways. What you think is right could be wrong. That's why we got this book from Genesis to Revelation. Verse 13, and God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Again, we got peer pressure and we got consequences for the wrong peer pressure. Let's go to Genesis 19. Got to give you examples how we were, we're not the only ones dealing with peer pressure. Everyone, and I hope this helps people who have a hard time trying to deal with peer pressure. The book is written for our admonition. It's for us to look back and say, man, they dealt with this. They dealt with something. Let me keep pushing on. Because some people get peer pressure and then when something happens, 
Let's just keep going. Let's keep reading. Ver Let's read Genesis 19. We're going to read about some other type of peer pressure that still goes on to this day. Genesis 19. And we're going to start at verse four. This is about Sodom and Gomorrah. Here's when the two angels came. And Lot met them. Let's read about some peer pressure. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, come past the house round, both old and young. So these were some old fogies and some young studs or bucks. All the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, where are the men which came unto thee this night? Bring them unto us that we may know them. They wasn't trying to, hey, my brother, how are you today? How are you doing today? We heard you're new in town and we just want to come out and say grace and peace unto you. No, this know them is to have sex with them. All these men of this city came because they they heard Lot had two people, two men, I guess what you want to call fresh meat, like in prison. And they wanted to know him, know them. And Lot went out the door unto them and shut the door after them. Now, I know there's some skeptics right now talking about, no, that know them doesn't mean that. Let's keep reading so we can know what know them truly means. Verse seven, and said, I pray you, bro, uh, brethren, do not so wickedly. So we got some peer pressure going on and we got lot fighting that pressure. This is what we got to do. Start fighting those pressures, right? Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and ye do to them as good as in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. So wait a minute. Lot is offering up two of his daughters that are virgins. So now we know in verse five, they didn't come to know these men by saying, hey, brother, how are you doing? They came to have sex with these dudes. And so Lot, not trying to give into that peer pressure, was like, look, take my daughters, but don't do so wickedly to these men. What they were going to do to his daughters was wickedly, too. He told them straight out, don't do this. Homosexuality is a major peer pressure these days, especially among trying to show the children that stuff. But back to the lesson. Verse nine, they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came unto sojourn and he will needs be a judge. See, remember Sodom, I mean, Lot was not a native of Sodom. Of Sodom. So they're sitting here saying, wait a minute, you ain't even from here and you're going to tell us how to live. You must be out your Sodom mind. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. So Lot wasn't giving into this peer pressure, right? So they wanted to deal with Lot the same way they wanted to deal with the men. But they said, we're going to do you worse than we're going to do those men. This was wicked. This is the peer pressure we got to avoid. 
because there's consequences. Verse 10, but the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house. Now the angels pulled Lot back into the crib, right? To them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were out, that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great. Didn't care if it was children. Didn't care if they was 12, 11 years old standing there. Whoever was there, peer pressure and Lot, they got hit with blindness. So that the that wearied themselves to find the door. Skip down to verse 17. And it came to pass when they had brought forth abroad that he said, escape for thy life. So after that happened, the angels told Lot what was about to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now they're giving him instruction. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain lest thou be consumed. So he's telling them, get out of here because we about to tear this whole place up. But don't look back. But somebody just had to look back. Verse 26, but his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt while they were escaping. Verse 26, I mean, verse 29. It came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. And when he overthrew the cities in the, which Lot dwelt, God told Abraham before what he was going to do. Abraham negotiated with him. When they got there, Lot showed compassion to these new men because Lot knew what Sodom was like. When them men came for them to, when all the men of the city came for them to men, which are really angels, Lot offered his daughters. And they threatened to kill him. Lot wasn't giving in to the peer pressure of Sodom and Gomorrah. And look what happened to Lot. He was saved from the destruction of the wicked ones. Let's go to uh, Genesis 37. Let's go to Genesis 37. We're going to read about Joseph. All right. We're going to read about Joseph had peer pressures too. Everybody in here had peer pressures. But what you got to understand is you got to, when you understand this book, you understand the commandments, you got to stick with the Lord. Genesis 37, verse 18. Genesis 37, verse 18. What we're about to read is about Joseph's brothers, the other, the other 10 brothers who were jealous of Joseph. Let's read Genesis 37, 18. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Joseph's own blood brothers wanted to kill him. And they said one another, behold, this dreamer cometh. Now come, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into the some pit. And we will say some evil beast hath devoured him and we shall see what shall become of his dreams. So, Usually peer pressure in the evil sense comes from one person's mind and they tell someone else or they tell this person and now they got backup. And that's what happened here. One of them brothers was brave enough to say, you know what, man, I'm sick of Joseph, man. Man, we should just kill him. Probably playing too. Like, man, we, we should kill him. And then other brothers was probably thinking the same thing. Yeah, man, you know, we should. Now all of a sudden they all want to kill him. But let's keep reading because one didn't. Verse 21, and Reuben heard it. And he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. So Reuben didn't give in to that peer pressure from his brothers. But he came up with a whole nother plan. Let's keep reading. 
And Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into the pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out of his hands to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass when Joseph was come into his unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat and the coat of many colors and that was on him. And they took him and cast him into the pit and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down and eat bread and they lifted up their eyes and look and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and mirth, carrying, going to carry it down to Egypt. Who were the Ishmaelites? Today, they're considered the Arabs. So for all those that always want to blame everything on the white man, White man did this. Hey, who was the first ones to do it to us? Yeah, let's keep reading. Verse 26. And Judah said unto his brethren, what profit, it, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. So now Judah, who all you guys want to claim you Judah? Yeah, look at your father. I'm probably Judah too. Look at my father. About that money, right? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. They were cool with this now. And they passed by Midianite merchantmen and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph unto Egypt. And Reuben returned into the pit and behold, Joseph was not in the pit and rent his clothes. So now we see Reuben wasn't a part of the, uh, the rest of the plan. He was like, no, we can't kill him. Let's throw him in the pit. But Judah talked to the other brothers while Reuben was gone, said, man, look, we can make some money off him. Do we understand, brothers, where we get? <laughs> I'm talking to Israel now. Everybody want to claim one of them tribes. But listen, when it comes to some stuff like this, oh, no, nah, man, you know, we was, you know, when we was in the land, man, everything was peaceful and all. Man, listen, our forefathers was wicked. Then they passed. Let me see. What are they going to? Oh, they have a judge returned from the pit. Behold, there was not. OK, verse 30. And he returned unto his brethren and said, the child is not. And I with us shall I go. And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped his coat in the blood. So they killed a lamb or a goat, a baby goat. They killed one and dipped his coat in the blood to make it look like it was Joseph's blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, this have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. So they lied. Yes, Israel, our forefathers was wicked, man. They was wicked. Let's go to verse 36. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, the officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. So the brothers gave in to each other. Reuben was the only one that was like, nah, let's not kill him. Let's, but he said, let's put him in the pit, let him die in there. But while he left, another brother said, nah, brothers, let's make some money off him. All this wicked stuff from peer pressure, man. All this wicked stuff from peer pressure. Let's go to Genesis 39. Let's see what happened to Joseph while he was there because he got peer pressured as well. All right. Genesis 39, we're going to start at verse one. And Joseph was brought down unto Egypt into Potiphar, the officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, and the Egyptian brought him out of the hands of the Ishmaelites and had brought him down hither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prop, prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So the Lord was with Joseph, 
And everything Joseph touched <laughs> turned to gold. All right. And his master saw verse three and his master saw that the Lord was with him. So wait a minute. You mean to tell me this Hamite Egyptian saw that the God of Israel was with Joseph? I thought these cats worshipped other gods. But this dude saw that the God of Israel was with Joseph. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace. Oh, here go grace again. Here go Christ, give him more grace in the Old Testament. Oh, my goodness. And Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him. I'm sorry. I read that wrong. He found grace in the sight of his master. Must correct myself. And he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put in his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and all over that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not aught he had saved. The bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. All because he stuck to what thus saith the Lord. He learned it from his daddy. Maybe that's why the other brothers was that jealous. Verse seven, and it came to pass of these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. Uh oh. And she said, lie with me. This lie with me is not tell me a, a story. She want to get down with Joseph. Same way those men wanted to know those men. This, per, this master's wife wanted to know Joseph too. Verse eight, but he refused. Oh, these days? Are you serious? The motto is now, oh, you married? Good, good. Because that means I ain't got to deal with you. We just friends with benefits. But Joseph knew this would be adultery because this is another man's wife. This goes to show people the laws have always been here. It wasn't something that was just made up on stone. In Moses' day, they've always been here. Verse eight, but he refused and said unto his master's wife, behold, my master knew not what is with me in this house. And he hath committed all that he hath in my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. This Egyptian trusted Joseph so much he gave him everything in his house except his wife. Because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Hold on. Hold on a minute. Wait a minute. Again, what is sin? First John three and four is the transgression of the law, right? But the law wasn't written on stone back then. But everybody knew what the law was about. Verse 10, and it came to pass that she spake unto Joseph day by day that, that he heareth, I mean, that he hearkeneth not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. So she pressuring Joseph every day, probably walking through the crib with a gown on, see through nighty, all that. While the master's away and Joseph probably polishing some statue or something and saying, oh, my goodness, why she got to do this? Hold on. Let me get. get that. Oh, my goodness, man. I'm trying to keep this master stuff clean. She over here. Oh, my goodness. Why? Why she got to. Okay. Um, let me go in another room and do something else. Let me go over there. Let me go over here and go. So you go in another room and she come walk behind Hey, Joseph. Oh, oh, my goodness. She didn't change the outfit, man. Please. 
Lord, please give me strength. I trust in you. That's probably what was going on with Joseph. Day by day, she did this to him. All right? That's what the book say. I lost my place. Verse 11, and it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. And there was none in, none of the men in the house there within. Oh, no. So now he's going in the house to do some work and there's nobody else there. Nobody there. Except her all by herself. And she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Ain't no, he probably walked around the crib like, man, how come ain't nobody here? She probably done sent them away. Y'all ain't got to work today. Don't want no witnesses. Now Joseph come in, like, man, let me, man I'm out of here. He left and she got a piece of his garment. He did the right thing because that's what Joseph was supposed to do. He was being what? A son of God, right? <clears throat> Let's keep reading. And it came to pass that when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of the house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came unto me to lie with me. See, now she's lying. And I cried with a loud voice, and it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my, my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until, the, until his Lord came home. So she kept the garment until her husband came home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant, which thou hast brought unto us, came unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, I lifted up my voice and cried, and he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did they did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. So now she peer pressured her husband by lying. Because the Lord told the truth of what really happened. The Lord watching everything and everybody. Verse 20, and Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison and a palace where the king's prisoners were abound. And he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So Joseph didn't give in to any of that peer pressure. These days, brother would have, man, brothers would have smashed up with the quickness. But then the Lord won't be with them. The Lord stayed with Joseph because Joseph didn't give in to that peer pressure. Even though he was put in prison, even in prison, the Lord was with, the, with, was with Joseph. Nobody wants to go to prison, but the Lord was with Joseph, Right? That was a demonstration of how some sisters, even some brothers, can sit up and try to peer pressure brothers, and brothers do it too, into having sex. Because remember, this was a married woman. If she wasn't married, it would have been fornication. That's the peer pressure that we deal with today. Everybody wants to have sex with everybody. But the Lord is like, no. Let's go to Habakkuk. Because I want to show another peer pressure when it comes to sex as well. And please, if you got teenagers, they need to listen to this. Let's go to Habakkuk 2. For those that don't know where Habakkuk is, well, it's the little prophet books. It's in between Nahum and Zephaniah. Most adults have dealt with what we're about to read. 
This is another form of peer pressure. But this is specifically for the brothers. It's for the sisters, but it's for the brothers, right? Rebecca 2, verse 15. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. What type of drink? I got water in this cup, so we ain't talking about this type of drink. What type of drink we talking about? That alcohol, we allowed to drink, people. It's just the Lord don't want you to get drunk. It's not a sin to drink. But what is the Lord saying through Habakkuk right here? Let's keep reading. Woe unto them that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, to make makest him drunken also, that thou mayst look upon their nakedness. Ooh. So, brothers, that be trying to go to the club. They'll be trying to get that little shorty some to drink so she can feel good. So you can see her nakedness. What did the Lord say? Let's read this 15 one more time. Habakkuk 2 and verse 15. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, that makest him drunken also, that thou may look upon the naked upon their nakedness. Sisters, you might as well say brothers these days because brothers will sit up and try to make another brother drink. We living in Sodom and Gomorrah and, and get him drunk. And then he waking up wondering, man, why? Why am I hurting? So if you go into the club, you go into the party and you're trying to force somebody to get somebody drunk so you can have sex with them, the Lord got a problem with it. Verse 16, thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink for glory, drink for glory. I'm sorry. Drink thou also and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee and shameful spewing shall be upon thy glory. That's that shameful spew. You know how you come on. You, I'm talking mostly to the sisters. You done got drunk. This dude, you didn't even you didn't even remember nothing you did last night. And you wake up and you look over, you be like, oh, oh, who are you? Oh, baby, you know what I'm saying? You know, you, you don't remember me last night, you know. You don't remember the things we did? You understand what I'm saying? No. That's that shame. And shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. Let's go. Hmm. Let me see. Yeah, we're going to skip that one. Let's go to Job 2. Let's go to Job 2. So, yeah, when it came to Joseph and he was trying to be seduced, can't be doing that. And then if you can't seduce the person and you decide you want to get them drunk, can't be doing that. That's what thus saith the Lord. That's not what say brother Azza. That's what the book say. All right? So, Job 2. Uh-oh. Job 2. Because we also got to fight off other types of peer pressure. Job 2, verse 9. Now, when it comes to Job, Job had everything. I mean, everything. He has a whole bunch of kids. He had money or flocks or whatever. And he was perfect when it came to the Lord. And then Satan is like, look, man, the only reason he the way he is is because you got this hedge around him. And yeah, take the hedge away. Let me at him. Let's see if he still honors you then after that. So the Lord was like, all right, go ahead. Satan comes down, does what he does to his family. His crops, 
Job is like, hey, whatever happens, happens. Satan comes again. Let me at Job now. Let me deal with him. He's like, all right, so God is like, all right, you can go ahead and mess with Job. Just don't kill him. Probably said it just like that, too, you know. Yeah, you can do what you want with Job, man. I ain't worried. Just don't kill him. Yes, sir. All right, so now Job does everything that he's doing, and he doesn't kill him. He got boils, sickness, all types of stuff, right? Let's listen to what his wife said after this was all going down. Verse 9. Job 2 and 9. Then said his wife unto him, Does thou still remain, I mean, still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. Oh, <coughs> whoa, wait a minute. How come I, me personally, this is my personal opinion, I don't think this chick knew about the resurrection. We know Job knew about the resurrection, but I don't think she knew. Who in their right mind would tell somebody curse God and die? Because if you know about the resurrection, you were going to wake up on fire. <laughs> There's no way I would have said something like that. I, I, that I, I don't think she knew about the resurrection or Satan entered, in, entered in her to say this to Job. That's a major peer pressure when it comes to your wife. It really is. And I dealt with that. Then again, Job 2 verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou remain, retain thy integrity, curse God, and die? Verse 10. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did God, I mean, did not Job sin with his lips? Because see, Job knew. If you go to, what is it, Deuteronomy 32? The Lord said, I created good and I created evil. So Job knew this stuff. Maybe he was, tried to teach his wife and she wasn't listening. All right? Maybe he tried. But he didn't fall for that peer pressure, did he? He ain't fall for it at all. And that's the way we all got to be, even when it comes to our wife or with our husband. We have to still stick with what thus saith the Lord. Let's go to Acts 5. Let's go to Acts 5. Let's read another wife and husband team. Acts 5, and we're going to start reading at verse 1. So that was Job telling his wife, hey, baby, you tripping. The Lord has created good and evil. Now let's read something else when it comes to peer pressure. Acts 5 verse 1. In those days when the numbers of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews <coughs> because their widows were neglected in the daily menstruation. Then the twelve called the multitudes of the disciples unto them. Ooh, I'm in the wrong book. Acts 5. Sorry, I was in Acts 6. Acts 5, verse 1. But a certain name, man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And they kept part of the price, his wife also being privy to it. So they said they was gonna they was gonna sell merchandise or whatever they had for a price, and this is when they were giving it to the church. But they held back some, and the husband and the wife knew it. Okay, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So they didn't bring everything. They brought back a certain part. But Peter said, Ananias, why hast thou, Satan, filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And he came back part and, and keep back part of the price of the land. See, the Holy Spirit was up there telling Peter, hey, man, this dude lying. 
Peter wasn't there with them. Remember, it said that this was between the husband and the wife privately. So the only one, the only way Peter could figure this out is if the Holy Spirit told him they lying. We got to remember stuff like that, man. Verse four. Why has it remained? Was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thy own power? Thou hast, thou hast, I mean, I'm sorry. Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? There's no way Peter could figure this out. It's in man's heart. Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Oh, that's how Peter found out. And Ananias, as hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. Man, that's scary. That's scary. You got a lie in your heart. And it's just waiting to come and be spoken. And the Lord's sitting there waiting for you to lie. Probably say, don't lie. Don't lie. I'm trying to give you a chance. Don't lie. And he lied. And great fear came on to them that heard these things. Everybody else was like, man, they was probably scheming and plotting too. It was like, man, no, I'm giving up everything I sold. I ain't, yeah. I just want to say this part too. I want to say this part too. When it comes to the feast days, this is for every camp that keeps the feast days. If you cook at the crib, whatever was given to you, you're not supposed to keep it for yourself. That's just a warning. I'm just trying to let people know you can't if they if, if you given food to cook. You're supposed to cook it all and bring it all. Not say, you know, I'm going to take me a couple of ribs for myself because that's the equivalent of what's going on right here. Just just wanted to say that. Any camp, any church that keeps the Lord's feast days. Whatever you cook for the Lord, it's supposed to go to the Lord. Now let's get back to this. And when the young men arose, wound him up and carried him out and buried him. Right. And it was about the space of three hours when his wife. See, here comes the wife now not knowing what was done, came in. She didn't even know her husband had died for lying. And Peter answered unto her, tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, yeah, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at the feet, at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came and found her dead and carried her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, upon as many as heard these things. Why are you reading this? Because if your husband or if your wife is breaking the commandments and you agree to keep doing it with them, you're just as guilty. The Lord don't play. The Lord don't play. Let's go to Matthew 10. She had a chance to tell the truth. But see, she conspired with her husband to lie. And what did the Lord say? This, who's going to be in that lake of fire? All liars. Matthew 10. Verse 34. Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I came to send peace with a sword. I'm sorry. I, I came not to send peace, but a sword. All of this peer pressure that we're dealing with, you got to stick to this word because the sword's going to come down in the house. 
or come down at your job or come down with your friends. And you better stick on the side of righteousness, because if you don't. Verse 35, for I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter in law against her mother in law. A man's foe shall be of they that is of his own household. Now, let's get something clear. The Lord said, honor thy mother and thy father. That's in the law. That is the commandment of God. But if your parents want to break the law, you must stick with the law. That's what this is saying. This is why people get divided. If you know homosexuality is wrong, according to scripture, according to God's way, not the ways of man, but you have a daughter, you have a son, you, your parents, children, decide they want to be gay. You have nothing to do with that. You have nothing to do with that. If any of my children decided in the future to come to me and be like, you know, you know, I'm, I'm gay. And I'm like, all right, you know, I still love you as a person, but don't expect me to come and support you in nothing like that. Nothing. But I'm getting married. You know what? Oh, no, you're not. That's not marriage. That's how you stick on the Lord's side. Because if you give into it, like most parents are doing these days, you're praising the wicked. And the Lord don't like that. Let's keep reading. And a man's foe shall be they of his own household. The first battles you're going to have when it comes to this book is at home. If your wife, children, parents have been dealing with another gospel, another Jesus, you know what I'm saying? Another spirit. And you come with this truth of what Jesus truly said. They're going to become your foes. Now, you don't want to treat them as such. Because, again, some people can absorb things right away. Some take years. All right. Plant the seed, let it grow, walk off. 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You, I love my children. My children know I love them. But I love the Lord more than I love them. Because I know in the end, when it's time to wake up, when it's time to, and I mean wake up in the resurrection, I ain't trying to be in the, in the fire for them. No sorry, bub. That's why I'm trying to teach them. So that we can all be on one accord. He that loveth mother and father more than me is not worthy of me. So again, if the Lord says honor your mother and father, fine. But if this, but if it's got something to do with going against the laws of God, hey, no, Ma, I can't come to that Christmas dinner. We'll fix you a clean plate. It's still dedicated to other gods. I can't come to that Christmas dinner. I tell you what, because of family's sake, maybe I'll eat me some and I come by and say hi to everybody. But I ain't staying. Don't expect me to say, Mary. Listen, I don't know about the rest of y'all, man. I can't wait till Wednesday. Because, I, again, I'll keep saying this is the most horrible time of the year. Because <laughs> I'm getting tired of the Merry Christmas. You know what I'm saying? Especially at the job. I'm like, and the way I deal with it, and I've told my children, I'm going to tell y'all the way I deal with it. When people be like, oh, Merry Christmas. I'll be like, hey, have a good day. And yeah, some of them going to look because that's a form of peer pressure. I'm glad I just got into that. Christmas, these holidays, that's another peer pressure that we all got to deal with that are trying to work straight with the Lord. And it irks me. It, I, I've been here for a minute and it still irks me. I'm not at that point where I'm like, oh, well, yeah. I'm just like, as soon as they say Merry Christmas, I'm like, oh. I was hoping they wouldn't say that. Have a good day. Don't let them turn around and say, hey, how come you ain't say Merry Christmas? Because now we about, we about to have some problems then. We about to have some problems because I'm about to tell you why I don't celebrate Christmas. 
or New Year's, same thing. Yes, we're in a peer pressure time right now. Those that are truly believers in trying to follow Christ, not follow the world that's saying Christ was born on 25th day of December. <clears throat> and I see, I see I'm having problems over here with uh, Facebook. I hope it's still staying there. Kind of getting into some things they don't want to hear. Now, so we did Matthew. So man's foes is of his own household. You can't love anybody more than the Lord. You show love to everybody. But if they're going to mess around and break the commandments of God, hey, it's the choice is yours to cut them off. Especially if they they being again. Most of us have dealt with this peer pressure right here. I'm about to talk about. All right. Again, when it comes to whatever we have done. In the past that we don't do anymore. Uh, before I keep going, everybody on Facebook, y'all still there? All right. Just if you're still on if Facebook, I know I see my uh, phone keeps glitching, but I hope everybody's still there. If you're still there, you know, throw some hearts up so I can see that you're still there. But um, one of the main things that we deal with this time of year with this peer pressure is teasing. All right. And I think it happens around April and uh, Easter, too, at the same time. Because we are not doing what the rest of the world does, we get teased about it. And there's a lot of children that get that as well. And they start feeling the pressure. I'm going to be honest with you. I feel more sympathy for the children of these days. Because when I was coming up, we didn't have this access to all this stuff. We were told something and that was it. All right. But now these phones is showing them everything. And I'm talking about evil stuff. It's showing them all types of evil stuff and their friends. And then when they're trying to do right, their friends tease them. There's a young lady that I know who did not want to go, knew she wasn't going to a Christmas party. And when she came back to school the next week, her friends teased her and got physical. That's got to be hard, man. That's got to be hard as a teenager these days. Especially in a Catholic school. That's got to be hard. And it breaks my heart to hear stuff like that. My own daughter felt a certain way, right? Yes. Which holiday was that? No, no, no. Halloween, that's right. My own daughter felt the same thing. And I, in my heart, I was like, oh, man. But I was like, okay, I'm glad she got through that. For Halloween, her classmates, right? Yeah. They wanted to go to a Halloween party. Now, they know Halloween ain't about God and it's about the world and but she told me, like, what, a week later? Was that like a week later? She told me, Daddy, I was feeling some type of way. And I'm like, what you mean? Well, my, well, my, you know, my friends wanted to go to this Halloween party, and I told them I can't go. And then wasn't it on a Friday night? I don't you don't even remember? Okay, well, she couldn't go. And she knew she couldn't go. And she told me she felt a certain way. Now, I understand why she feels a certain way. Because this is her first time going through this. See, my kids, two of my children live with me now. When they was with their mother, they was all in the world. Now they're learning what Christ is about. And they're, they're, it, she's feeling it. She's feeling it. And it, it, it kind of hurts my heart to, for her to go through these things. But the thing is, it's better to go through it now and learn because in the future, it gets worse. It gets worse. Some of us at our job. No, I can't come to that Christmas party. There are jobs that tell, I know this sister, her job told her, you better come to this Christmas party. Or either you fired or won't. There was something. 
like it was mandatory to come to this Christmas party. So she told me she went to the party. She sat down and say nothing to nobody and left. That's the peer pressures of this world. That's just it's bad. Let's go to Acts 16. That is the peer pressures of this world. Adults got to deal with it too, children. We got to deal with it too. But you got to start right now. Because if you keep giving in to the peer pressures of this world, it when you get older, you may stay with the world. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that at all. Acts 16, we're going to start at 16. Let me make sure, because I remember last time I wrote down the wrong thing. Okay. Acts 16, we're going to read about Paul. Verse 16. And it came to pass, as we went into prayer, and certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us. And brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. So someone is breaking the commandments of God by soothsaying and bring, making money off of it, right? For her masters. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High, which show us the way of salvation. And this did many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said unto the said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of, came out the same hour. So Paul cast out an evil spirit out of this woman. And when the masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone. Oh, so when people started seeing that their money, oh man, we ain't going to make no money off it because he cast out a spirit out of her. It was a problem now. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them magistrates saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs. Whoa, what was the customs they were teaching? They were teaching the law of God through Christ, through Jesus. which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. Salvation is for all nations. It doesn't matter if you Jew, Gentile, Israel, whatever, Hamite, Ishmaelite. Doesn't matter. And the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Oh, so Paul and Silas were getting beaten for this word of God. All they did is that this woman kept coming and following them and telling everybody these men have are showing us the way to salvation. Evidently, the woman was fighting the spirit that was within her. And Paul turned around and got rid of it. But before that, she was making money soothsaying for these vendors. But because Paul did that, he got beat. These are things that may happen in the future, people, when it comes to keeping this word of God. We might get beat. The peer pressures of this world is no joke. Let's keep reading. And when they had laid many stripes upon him, they cast him into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who had received such a charge, trust them unto the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. So they put him in the prison, put chains on them and had somebody sit there and watch. 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. So you mean to tell me? And all this calamity that was going on, they praised God. They didn't turn around and say, oh, God, why are you doing this to me? Why? Why is this happening? They were like, hey, praise the Lord. Because they knew the Lord was going to keep them. 
And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's hands were loose. Everyone's hands, not just Paul and Silas. And the keeper of the prison awaking out of, the, uh, out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been, had been fled because that was the law of the land. You guard these prisoners, if they escape, you die. So most of them cats killed themselves instead of being tortured to die. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do not harm, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. <clears throat> Hold on a second here. You mean to tell me, Paul was in prison by his captors and there was a guard sitting right there and he escaped because the Lord helped him escape. But when Paul saw that this dude was going to kill himself, he stopped him. These days, these Hebrews wouldn't have said nothing. They'd have let the dude kill himself and probably rejoiced over that. Edomite, the devil. What did Paul do then? Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling. Oh, the, the guy did, I'm sorry. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, sirs, remember this is the guard for the Romans. What must I do to be saved? This ain't no Israelite. This is a guard of the Romans, a Gentile. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. How do you believe on Christ? We read earlier in Revelation 4, keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Right? And what did Jesus say? Keep the commandments of God. So it's not just I believe on Christ because there's another Jesus out here. Remember, there's another Christ and there's false Christ that Christ told us was going to come in Matthew 24. So you got to believe on the one true Messiah, the Christ, who I call Jesus. But do you understand that Paul gave compassion to this brother? Paul was under tremendous peer pressure got beat, got thrown in prison. And when he came out, just like Joseph, he was like, hey, don't worry about it. Joseph was like, hey, this was all, God did all this to preserve Israel. Joseph is like, hey, you, wanna, you want salvation? This is how you do it. Why didn't Joseph do like some Hebrews today? Like, how can I be saved? You can't be saved because you the damn devil. He pointed him to Christ, man. That's what Paul did. Proverbs 15. And I'm quite sure Paul did it this way, the same way all of us should do it. Because there's a lot of us that's watching some of the wrong brothers and sisters teach. Especially on the street. I'm quite sure Paul did exactly what Jesus did. In this manner, Proverbs 15, verse 1, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. I'm quite sure that's how Paul talked to this dude who was guarding him. You want to be saved, bro? Just believe on Jesus Christ. And that's the way we all have to deal with every type of peer pressure because let's read it again. A soft answer turn away wrath. Hey man, do you celebrate Christmas? No, I don't celebrate Christmas, man. That stuff is pagan and blah, blah, blah. 
you ain't getting nobody like that. You're not bringing nobody to the wedding like that. Hey, man, do you celebrate Christmas? No, man, I don't celebrate Christmas. Well, why not? You truly want me to show you? I can show you out the Bible. Now you got somebody interested, probably, if they're really seeking the, the master's voice. Verse 2, Proverbs 15 and 2. A tongue of the wise knoweth knowledge outright. I mean, all right. I'm sorry, read that again. A tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. And unfortunately, within Israel, we got a lot of people who pour out foolishness, which makes them what? Paul did what he did because he was a follower of Christ, right? And we should all be the same way a follower of Christ. Let's go and see how Jesus handled peer pressure directly from Satan. Let's go to Luke 4. If we're going to deal with the things of this world, we got to try to be like Christ, right? That's why I call myself a Christian. Yes, I'm Hebrew. Yes, I'm an Israelite. By blood, but by faith, I'm a Christian, which means Christ-like. So I'm trying to do what Christ said to do and what he did. So let's see how Christ handled Satan. Luke 4, verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, wait a minute, I'm in Acts. My fault. Luke 4. Because I know Christ didn't speak to the people when he was speaking to Satan. That did not sound right. All right, here we go. And Jesus, being full of the Holy, the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, returned from Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil, the same way it was in the garden with Eden. I mean, with Eve. The exact same thing being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days, he did eat nothing. And when he was ended, after he afterward, he hungered. And the devil said unto him, if thou be the son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, by every word of God. Does it say here that Jesus was yelling at him? He just answered him with scripture. That's it. Let's keep reading. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, all this power I will give, I, I will give thee and the glory of them for it is delivered unto me and whomsoever, whomsoever I will give it. Thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. <clears throat> More peer pressure. He pressuring them hard. Remember, he hasn't, Jesus also has not eaten for 40 days and he's hungry. Most of us would do anything. But Jesus is sitting here doing what? Going back over, going back and forth with Satan with the word of God, not our own understanding. And Jesus, verse eight, and Jesus answered and said unto him, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written that thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. And him only shalt thou serve. Verse nine. And he brought him into Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands, they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. So now let's let's look at these three temptations so far. He was hungry. Right. So he's telling them. Turn this rock into some bread. And that didn't work. All right. Let's try something else. How about I give you all this power? I give you all the riches of the world. If you just worship me, and that didn't work. Right. So now he's. Using 
Satan is using scripture now because that's what happens these days. When you're trying to do the right thing according to the Lord, there are other people that know these scriptures too and they try to twist it. That's another form of peer pressure. That's why you have to study and get understanding with all this knowledge because people will use scriptures to twist something to get you in the other direction because Satan know these scriptures too and he got ministers out here. But how did Jesus answer him? With scripture again. And Jesus answering and said unto him, it is said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. So that's how you ward off peer pressure with each other. That's how we ward it all off. But notice Jesus just answered questions and he was hungry, extremely hungry. Let's go to Matthew 1, uh, Matthew 5. Matthew 5. When you have any type of peer pressure going on, that you know is going against the word of God, the law and the testimony, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, you reach back to this book because the Lord is the one that's showing us the words that I'm showing you in this book is going to lead you to salvation through Christ. And you ain't got to get all angry and mad. That's the other thing. I wanted to touch on, but I'm running out of time. Anytime somebody's dealing with you, you don't have to get mad. If somebody clap at you, you don't have to clap back. You don't have to clap back at everything. I'm going to tell y'all, man, I got people that clap at me and I don't say nothing. Sometimes I do, but most of the time I don't. It don't feel good. Sometimes it's brothers that I thought I was close with. I thought I was brothers I looked up to. And I just be like, okay. And it's going to hurt. It's good things. And let me just say that too, because people want to always keep their emotions and have this tough role. Like, you know, nothing can hurt me. No, it's going to hurt. If you got peer pressure and you go against it and people going to tease you, they're going to talk about you. They're going to say things that once you find out they said it, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. Go in your closet and pray to the Lord then, not the literal closet. I don't want to come home and be like, where my daughter and my son? And they in the closet. What y'all doing in the closet? We're praying. No. Isolate yourself from everybody else. And pray to the Lord for that pain to go away and pray for whoever was messing with you. That's what we should be. That's what we're supposed to be. Jesus even told us. Let's read Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Let's read what Jesus said. If we're trying to be Christ-like. And deal with this peer pressure the way that he did. Let's read what he said about the blessed people. Matthew 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. So let's understand something. Christ saw the multitudes of people. And he left them and went up into a mountain. And the disciples came unto him. <laughs> All right. Verse two. And he opened his mouth and taught them. Saying. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So if you're poor in spirit and low. and You're, you're blessed. Strengthen your spirit. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You get bullied. Someone dies. Someone broke your heart. 
and you mourning about it, if you pray unto the Lord, what did he say? For they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness does not mean weakness. For all you Hebrew Israelites that want to be hard and all of this. The Lord said, blessed are the meek. Let's understand something. In Moses' time, he was the meekest person on the earth. But when he went, when you went against his God, he, he drew that sword out. Remember what he did when he went to go get Lot. But he was the meekest person on the earth. Like Christ. Meekness does not mean weakness. I don't need to teach. Yeah, murder, fear, fear and the devil and all that. Blah, 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 blah. I don't need to do all that. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You're trying to get this real righteousness, right? You can be filled too, but you gotta you gotta study as well. Don't always listen to somebody else, not even me. You must study because that because at the end of the day, you are gonna be judged for your actions. You ain't going to be judged by what I told you. I'm going to be judged whatever I did and whatever I taught. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Isn't that what we read about Paul? Don't you want mercy from the Lord? And you got to give mercy too. Blessed are the pure at heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Oh, so if you out here teaching hate, if you out here, I'm speaking to Israel now, if you out here telling other Israelites, hate the white man, hate the Hamite, hate all these heathens, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children. Oh, you're not going to be a children of God then. This is peacemakers. You're supposed to be teaching everyone salvation through Christ, through peace, not yelling and screaming. But hey, if that's what you want to do, because that's your job, because that's what your father wants you to do, then do what you must. But the real children of God, they going to see the difference. That's why I don't be worried anymore. I used, man, I, back in the day, some of my brothers could tell you, man, I used to go hard on some other Hebrews because I'm like, man, these, they, they lead people away. But the Lord said, all that is his, he ain't going to lose. So ain't no use of me getting mad at them brothers no more. I'm going to just teach this word for what it is and let the people decide. Verse 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness. For righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So if you're being persecuted, if you're being persecuted, for righteousness sake, not just being persecuted because you're black. All right. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I was walking down the street. No, that, that curses now. But if you're teaching this word the correct way and you're being persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, blessed are ye, which men shall revile you and persecute you. Oh, we got that peer pressure again, huh? And, this, and, and notice something. Let's read that again. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. This ain't just talking about all the other nations. It's talking about Israel too. This is also talking about Israel. When your own brothers come against you the same way our forefathers 
came against Christ, came against Paul, came against all the apostles and the prophets. And shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. But this is what you do when this peer pressure is so heavy. You don't go into a corner and, and want to die or kill yourself, anything like that. Even though that's what you want to do because you want to make it all better. And if I'm not living here anymore, you know, you know, and some people, you know, they've been taught that once you die, you go to heaven. So that's why this, the suicide rate is so high. But it's a lie. You don't go to heaven. You don't go to hell until the second resurrection. Judgment day. What you do is, verse 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they, the prophets, which were before you. All the prophets that was before Jesus in this time, he's telling them when all these things is going bad for you and you being persecuted for righteousness sake and people lying on you and you know, you know, you telling the truth and and they lying on you anyway to put you in jail like Paul beat you and all that stuff. He said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. That's why Paul was singing praises when he was locked up in prison in chains. That's what we have to do. That's exactly what we got to do because peer pressure is no joke. And the ways of this world is getting worse and worse and worse. So this wasn't just for teenagers. This was also for adults. All right. So I thank y'all for watching. Uh, share the video. Sit your kids down, you know, talk to them because there may be some things they're going through. And I know some kids, they scared to tell their parents, you know, because, you know, they think their parents don't know nothing. But talk to them. All right. Because their peer pressure, their peer pressure, in my opinion, is worse than what ours was. All right. So, again, I thank y'all for watching. Share the video. Happy Sabbath. Shut I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, Shalom. Shalom. Happy Sabbath. All glory to the Father in the mighty name of Jesus. Peace.